designed to encourage, empower, and educate real estate professionals by sharing best practices from business leaders that are proven winners. I'm your host, Kyle Malnati, and this is Calibrate Real Estate. Broadcasting from the Mile High City, thank you for tuning in to the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Malnati, and as you know, we are broadcast on iTunes, but you might not know that we're also simulcast on YouTube. So if you want to check us out, I'm actually in my home office right now recording this podcast intro. Please check us out on YouTube. And if you're on iTunes, we absolutely love the ability to get reviews, to get content reviews. A five-star review gives the people who put this podcast together life. Uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, whether you just do a review by clicking the fifth star, or if you actually write a review, uh, we'll read that on air if you'd like. Well, our next episode, this is the sixth installation of content from a real estate conference that Calibrate Real Estate hosted here in Denver. Jimmy Mackin is the featured speaker. Jimmy Mackin is the co-founder of a company based out of Boston called Curator. And Curator is in the business of helping real estate professionals with digital marketing. Digital marketing is a huge buzzword in our industry. And it's a way of really capturing quality leads and really doing a great job of harvesting people that you've had in your digital farm for a long time. So I'm a big believer in digital marketing. We're on lots of social media platforms, and we're also doing constant email marketing, which Jimmy is an expert. So we're excited to share this content. His company, again, is called Curator, and I'm going to spell Curator's website for you. That Curator website is C-U-R-A-Y-T-O-R. Jimmy Mackin's a professional speaker. You can contact us to get him hired. If you have a need for a speaker at an event, just send an email to info at calibrate.re.com. Well, for my producer, Kayla Davis, I'm Kyle Malnati. We're going to kick this episode off with an intro from Amy Campbell and then Jimmy Mackin. Thank you so much. We'll see you around the neighborhood. Bye guys. You guys are in for a treat. His name is Jimmy Mackin, and he is the co-founder of Curator, which is a full-service digital marketing company focused on helping clients acquire, nurture, convert, and retain customers through Facebook marketing. In under four years, Curator has grown to over 10 million in annual recurring revenue and has been featured in Forbes Inc., The Huffington Post, USA Today, and American Express Open Forum. So Jimmy lives and works in Boston, and again, he was our gracious host for our happy hour last year, and one of our favorite presenters, so we're very excited to have him back this year. So please welcome Jimmy Mackin. Yeah, she mentioned, uh, last year you guys had it in Boston. Who, here, who was here last year in Boston? Just by show of hands. Cool. Yeah, you guys show up. That's, that's encouraging. I think that's actually one of the defining characteristics, uh, at least what I've seen studying businesses, is that... You know, the types of people who actually show up are the types of business owners who actually are successful. Cruz, you want to lower the levels just a little bit for me? I'll project. Thanks, buddy. Uh, you know, it's one of the characteristics I see. Businesses who are willing to show up, right, are the ones that actually make decisions, that actually get things done. I almost didn't show up today, as Eric Rollo knows. I tried to back out of the event. I was sick all week. And uh, I got news that I was also flying Southwest Airlines this morning. Yeah. So, um, you know what happens when you fly, you know, a plane like that? I, I call my friends up, and everyone says the exact same thing to me. They say, Jimmy, it's the safest time to fly after there's a plane crash, because they're checking everything. That doesn't help at all. <laughs> everyone says that. I don't get it. That has nothing to do with my presentation today, but it just kind of sticks out to me. Um, we're in this really interesting time right now with digital marketing. Uh, there's all this turmoil. There's all this anxiety. There's all this confusion. You're seeing it right now with Facebook in particular, but this is true for big businesses as well. Everyone's wondering what's happening with data. The consumers are becoming less and less uh, feeling like they trust us as businesses. So we have challenges right now as marketers and as entrepreneurs to be able to connect with businesses, and I think, in, in a really unique and special way. And, and in my mind, when I think about what the next few years are going to be defined by, they're going to be defined by sort of the old school tactics that we, we all sort of grew up admiring. And the businesses who try to take shortcuts 
And the businesses who try to cut corners uh, are, are going to become less and less effective over time. And today I'm going to cover five digital trends with you, things that I think are really important everyone in the room here understands how to execute on. Uh, and I feel like if we can rally around these basic ideas, we can position ourselves to be successful in 2018 and, and beyond. And I think the one characteristic of everyone in this room is you're ambitious. And the challenge with ambition is ambition can kind of pull you in a lot of different directions. Can you guys relate to that? You feel like you see new stuff coming out all the time and you kind of want to go after that. I think what I find when I work with my clients, having some basic principles and some basic philosophies can help kind of guide the landscape. Back in 1998, a company called Webvan uh, came out. They were the first company ever to allow consumers to actually order groceries online. They raised, it's crazy, right? This is 1998, think about that for a second. They, ra they raised $300 million of venture capital. They employed over 3,500 people. And within three years, they were completely bankrupt. Who bought this company? I, I heard Walmart, Amazon. Amazon bought them in 2003. When did Amazon roll out Amazon Fresh? Anyone have any idea? 2006, 2007, really 2008? So for about four years, Amazon sat on this idea and didn't do anything with it. And when you guys go, when we go through today's session, I cover these ideas and these topics with you, what you're gonna realize is that there's, you're gonna hear some good ideas. Some ideas are gonna maybe transform the way you think about marketing but the timing might not be right. And great businesses can hear a good idea and they can hold on to it for a little while before they actually execute it. You might not have a big enough team, you might not have the resources, you might not have the people, something might hold you back, but the willingness to sort of hang on to an idea and wait for the timing is a defining characteristic of successful businesses. Now Walmart also tried to roll this out, right? Have you guys seen this? Walmart actually did the exact same thing Amazon did, which is they actually will now, you can go on walmart.com, and order groceries, the only difference is they will come into your house and they will actually put the groceries away for you. So when you hear a good idea, you have to obviously make it your own. And you guys are surrounded by great ideas all day today, right? And I think it's one of the things that you, you, you get when you come to a conference like this. Um, but just to hear an idea and then just to apply it directly to your business doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? You gotta make it your own. You gotta have some principles that drive your behavior. One of the things I find fascinating about brand, because Amazon's now going to become the first trillion dollar company. They are going to become the most successful company, unless they get broken up, the most successful company in American history and just business in general. The one defining factor of Amazon is they define their brand really clearly. And if you look at the stat here, this is actually a breakdown of the factors that drive consumers' behavior when they're looking for information online. What are they going to click on? So is it someone that, someone that offers a discount? Someone offers a deal? Is it them disclosing all the information? You'll notice that consumers are more likely to click on something in the search engines or an ad on Facebook or open up an email if they know the brand. Now we all kind of get that concept. If you know the brand, you inherently trust it. If you trust the brand, you're inherently gonna interact with that brand. But so much of what we do from a digital marketing perspective is driving traffic, not building an audience. BuzzFeed is traffic. The New York Times is an audience. I want you guys to wrap your head around that concept because it's really important. When you think about short-term hacks, like click this, buy this now, do this right this second, they might inflate your marketing results temporarily, but long-term, all you're doing is conditioning consumers to ignore you. Does that make sense, right? The Amazon brand isn't defined by just the fact they sell books, right? The Amazon brand was defined by the fact that they want to make things convenient, they want to make things fast, they want to make things easy, they want to make things cheap. That was their brand, that was it about. It wasn't the product. If you look back in 1999, even 95 and 92, all they did was sell books basically online. Today they sell whatever they want. Amazon is obviously a company that we look to and we say, wow, they're doing some amazing work. But when you think about the scope of Amazon in terms of what they've done to retail, you start to look at, wow, is there anything we can do in real estate that we can apply to our businesses that can emulate what Amazon's doing? I'll give you a couple examples in just a moment. But in real estate, I think Zillow's a boogeyman, right? Guys, I wouldn't be scared of Zillow. I'd be scared of Amazon, because Amazon eats people's lunch. 
Every industry, every market, they go in and they just take over. I don't think they're getting real estate. I'm not saying that. But I'd be scared of a company like Amazon. And I would like to embrace the idea of what are they doing differently that I can apply to my business. Amazon's a dragon slayer. That's what we like to call them, right? <laughs> let's, talk about, let's talk about what Amazon does well. And we're going to get into some tactics. One of the things I love doing is I love going over specific tactics. Did I go back on that slide? <laughs> not my bad. Um, I like talking about specific tactics, right? We're going to go high level, then we're going to go drill down to the very micro level here. But what Amazon does well, and I want you guys to write this down, they have clarity and vision. Amazon's about one thing, right? And that is speed, it's convenience, it's ease of use, it's, it's inventory. They, make a, they have a willingness to invest in the long term. This is the big one. Jeff Bezos has this famous quote, I love it. It's, do things that are going to be relevant five years from now. Invest in things that are going to be relevant five years from now. We're, we're too, I feel like, we're too spoiled in a lot of ways, where if we run a Facebook ad, or we shoot a video, and we send an email, and it doesn't go viral, and people don't bang our door down, we sort of like, well, that didn't work. Amazon and companies like Amazon are embracing this idea they're making investments in things that don't change, and they're making investments in things that are going to be relevant five years from now. The last thing is they're committed to excellence, they're committed to quality. This is a big one. This is a challenging thing. I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. Uh, you know, Curator started out in my bedroom, and now I have 67 employees. I, I, it's it's, it's kind of crazy when I think about it. I don't say it to brag. I, I, it scares the shit out of me. My payroll is $400,000 like, a week, it feels like. And I see it come through, and I'm like, do we even have the money to afford that? And, and when I, when I, when I, we do, luckily. But what, what, what's interesting to me is that when you're small, right, when it's just a few people, you can beat that drum, right? Quality, excellence, quality, excellence is what we're about. As the company expands and grows, you get removed one level, two levels from the customer, and, and that's very challenging. And, and something we've been dealing with the curators we've scaled the business now to closing on $15 million this year in revenue, like making sure everyone understands what the gold standard is. And you don't expect that, and you don't plan for that when you're growing your business originally, but it sneaks up on you. So one of the things I think great businesses do, if they have clarity and vision, and they have a commitment to making these long-term investments, then that can lead to producing higher quality, um, higher quality results for the customer. So let's get into the five things I wanted to cover with you guys today. Uh, these are five digital trends that are going to shape the landscape of real estate, going to shape the landscape of small businesses for the next few years here. Uh, we've had this obsession with leads. You guys have seen this, right, where people are selling leads online, you can buy leads. How many people are getting more leads today than they got three years ago? Just by a show of hands, right? Lead volume's increasing. Is it costing you more money to generate those leads? Right. So there's two things happening. The cost of lead generation is going up, and the quantity of leads is also increasing. And what happens is, is that businesses, when you make the transition to go into digital, you're so excited about the opportunity to generate leads that all you do is focus on that top of funnel, right? Selling to people who don't know who you are. And I think the takeaway here is it's expensive to sell to strangers. One of the big shifts I want you guys to think about right now, if you're heavy into lead generation, is I want you to think about making the transition from not just new client acquisition, but client retention. And I'm not gonna talk about door knocking or dropping off gifts, I'm gonna give you some digital strategies to help you achieve this, but making the move as a business to, to actual retention is a really critical piece of your business. I'll give you some stats on this. It's six to seven times more expensive to acquire a new customer than it is to keep an existing customer. A 5% in, well, I'll actually go back here for a second. Let's see if I got that slide. I sent these slides like last minute. I'm sorry, Kayla. Um, your likelihood to sell to a new prospect, right, is 5 to 20%. That's pretty, like, I don't think, I think it's kind of bullshit, honestly. It's like probably 1%. But your likelihood to sell to an existing customer, 60, 70%, because they know you, they like you, they trust you, okay? Brands say, or consumers say, they would pay for a better experience. But the consumer isn't loyal. When you think about retention for a second, if you close 25 deals this year, 30 deals this year, 85% of those consumers say they would use you again. Some of the stats that NAR put out recently, right? Number varies, 83, 87%. They said, I would use my real estate agent again. Does anyone know what percentage actually do? It's like 15, 17%. That's depressing. 
Why do, why do people lie to us? Why do they say that they love us, but then they don't actually use us again? We don't stay in touch. Now, this is a great point. What do we do to stay in touch with people? We call them on their birthdays, their anniversaries. We send them things in the mail. What was the last part? Party. We throw them parties. We treat them like they're 13-year-old girls, right? <laughs> See, there, there's something interesting that there's a guy I want you guys to write down. His name's Greg Danes. Greg Danes, D-A-I-N-E-S. They call him the churn whisperer. Greg Danes. Yeah, it's called churn. So in software, they call it churn, which is like when you lose a customer. In real estate, it's like when they hire your competition, right? Same thing. There's a law of diminishing returns. If consumers know you, they like you, they trust you, that doesn't mean they're going to use you again. And everyone in this room can relate to that. You've had your friend or a family member or a, a, someone you did a great job for actually go out and use somebody else. And the question is why? It's not because you didn't, they didn't love you. It's because you stopped being relevant and you stopped adding value. It's so important everyone in this room understands this concept because this is going to help you dramatically increase the profitability of your business long term if you understand that retention is the single highest priority of any business. doesn't make a difference in your real estate or your small business or your software company like Curator. Retention is the name of the game. It costs less money to acquire a customer. It costs less money to keep that customer. And that customer ends up yielding a lot more profit for your business. So how do you stay relevant? Well, you have to add and you have to deliver content that keeps them interested. You have to add, d deliver content that keeps them engaged. The consumer's process changes after the transaction. Prior to the transaction, what happens is they're looking for homes for sale. They're wondering what the value of their home is. They're thinking about how does this process work? How, how are they going to negotiate a deal? How do I get a mortgage, right? But after the transaction, when they own a home or a condo, they don't need any of that information. Yet the only thing we're equipped to do in real estate from a digital marketing perspective is keep sending them the same stuff. Does that make sense? So we have to turn the corner here for a second and invest in some digital marketing strategies that actually connect with consumers and stay relevant. Here's a couple of examples for you guys. I'll go rapid fire style for you. Um, this one I love, what's the story behind the landmark property? A good example of a content marketing strategy, a content marketing play for your network, your past clients, your sphere of influence, whatever you want to call them, is keeping them informed of what's happening in the market. This is relevant for anyone, if they're building a new development, if a new restaurant's going up, if there's a construction happening, everyone sees it in the area, no one really knows what's happening. You guys already know what, what's happening, but the consumer doesn't. Keeping them informed is how you add value post-transaction. Featuring local businesses and highlighting the community. This is a big one. How many people here do like community-centric content right now? Okay. About one-third of the room. Big opportunity there for us. Featuring events. So the first one was what's happening. The second one was featuring a local business. Third one was just, you know, this is a events. Same thing with this, this fourth one here, what's happening. These are examples of content plays you guys can actually begin to execute on that will help you retain your customers, keep them interested, add value. And you guys can probably think of a dozen more examples of this, but when, I, when you look at your overall digital marketing strategy, I want you to ask yourself, how much of my time, energy, effort is spent on new client acquisition versus retention? And what am I doing from a digital marketing perspective to stay engaged with these people? There's a wonderful site I want you to write down. It's called Think with Google. They release studies on consumer behavior. If you guys are worried about Facebook, you shouldn't be. You should be worried about Google. They know everything about you. It's crazy. They, they, they track everything, and, and they report on it, the trends, right? And what's interesting to me is you'll start to understand that people after a transaction actually do as much searching as they do before the transaction. In the beauty space, 60% of online searches are done post-purchase. So as an example, just one more example here for you guys, you know, 10.5 ways to make your home smart. So home improvements, how to, ideas to remodel, these things we've, we're comfortable talking about, but for whatever reason, we're not making the necessary investment in them to stay relevant. Then when you send the email, hey, prices are going up, hey, values have increased, 
hey, would you like to schedule a time to talk? They're much more apt to actually reply to it because you've put the effort in to keep them engaged. You follow me? Like, that's a big deal. Simply ignoring them for three years and then saying, hey, do you want to sell your home because it's been three years and the average is 3.5 years, you're probably going to, like, that ain't going to work, right? They're going to move on from you. That's why that's that big gap there, guys. So number one is I want you guys to think about investing in digital marketing from the client retention standpoint, not just new client acquisition. You have to have that balance. Right now in real estate, I see it like 90-10, 90% on new client acquisition, 10% on retention. It really needs to be much closer to like 70, 30, 60, 40. You know, you can't invest all your time in past clients, but it has to be a lion's share of what you're trying to do there. Okay, let's move on to trend number two, the death of the ISA. How many people in this room have an ISA by show of hands? We got one, two. How many people here have tried an ISA program before? Is it working out for you? Sure, ISA is an inside sales rep, I agent, technically. And so what they do is, the person who picks up, let me, let me, let me define it for everyone, okay? <laughs> Someone who is unqualified, inexperienced, calling unqualified leads is an ISA. <laughs> I'm not gonna call you out, Brad. Well, and Brad, you might be much more in line with what I'm, what I'm about to teach everyone here today. This is something that, what happens is, so we get a bunch of leads, we're running these Facebook ads, we're cat, buying leads from Zillow, whatever it might be but we're too busy to call these unqualified leads. So what do we do? We find somebody, we underpay them, we don't train them, and we give them 100 leads a call and say, go ahead and get me some business. And we wonder why this model doesn't work. See, the consumer doesn't want to talk to a gatekeeper, they want to talk to an expert. So we have this immediate misalignment where the consumer doesn't want to be qualified. They want to get the information they're looking for. So one of the things I think is so important about this, and I'll talk about some techniques here in a second, is that we have to think about the ISA role, the inside sales associate. The first person who talks to your customers as one of the single most important roles at any organization. And I'm gonna give you some examples of some ads you guys can run to find these people. I think cold calling is the stupidest thing imaginable. I don't know why people do it. And I realize there are, and I go to events like this and, and people kind of moan. They say, Jimmy, I, you know, I cold call Fizbos, I cold call Expires, and you know, my business is growing, you're wrong. I'm not wrong, okay? That's one way of doing your business, right? That's one way of actually reaching customers, picking up the phone and annoying the shit out of people. But that's not how great businesses are built. And we have to stop convincing ourselves that's the only option. The gurus have ran out of ideas. Consumers in 2018, consumers in 2010, consumers in 2000 didn't want people to cold call them. But yet, for whatever reason in real estate, they beat this drum. Jimmy, the most you know, experienced agent who's selling the most amount of homes, she walks around the neighborhood and door knocks. And then she calls, like, I feel bad for her. Like, you gotta pump yourself up in the morning for that. Like, they have to do this. You guys know this, right? They have like their 5 a.m. ritual. They get up, like, I don't get up at 5 a.m., guys. They get up at like 5 a.m. and they have these calls and they like pump themselves up just to basically like live through that. And, and, People don't want to be annoyed. So why don't we align our behavior with consumers' behavior and what consumers want? And you'll feel like you actually start to lean into something special there. This is how salespeople think they spend their time. This is how my salespeople think they spend their time, right? <laughs> Crushing it, hustling, kicking ass. <laughs> it's true. This is how they actually spend their time, right? Talking about how great they are. I love bash down salespeople. Um, my salespeople. Yeah, but like, you know, if they're not, like, I don't have the other one, which is like how difficult their job is. That's usually the other one, it's the other bucket. Um, you make money when your salespeople are talking to customers. You don't make money when they're talking about themselves. You don't make money when they're, let's say, organizing their database. You don't make money when they're complaining about the lead quality. You make money when they're talking to customers and building meaningful relationships. This is how you want people spending their time. When you look at cold calling, and guys, just to make sure we, we broaden the spectrum and the definition here for a second, when I define cold calling, I'm referring to cold calling as calling unqualified internet leads. That is cold calling. That is calling expires, that's FISBOs, calling people who basically just filled out a form to view something on your website, that is cold calling, okay? Let's be clear about that. The math doesn't work. It can over time, and if you've got a system in place where you've got a boiler room, you know, maybe you can, you can put it in, in place, but you're gonna have high turnover with your staff. And we got a lot of business owners in this room right now. You know, we could talk about how that doesn't affect us, but man, turnover is expensive. 
Turnover is demoralizing. It, it, we feel jaded when we lose somebody, right? But the math doesn't add up when you think about cold calling. The amount of attempts they have to make to make a contact and the amount of contacts that lead to an appointment and the amount of appointments that lead to a deal, when you factor in the fact that the number of leads are increasing and the cost is rising, something's got to give here, right? One thing I like to do and one thing I like to coach our, our, our clients on and our coach our team on is this idea of calling people when they show intent. This is really important. So when someone just simply fills out a form, that's not technically intent. But when they maybe read your about page or your reviews page, that is intent. If you publish an article about, let's say, you know, seven things buyers love that sellers fail to mention, someone actually opens up that email, that's intent. If it's just new listings, new listings, new listings, that's not intent. If you can start to think about your marketing as establishing some, some intent so you can identify the right people to follow at the right time, you're going to dramatically improve the amount of people that you're going to convert that are in your network, in your database. Does that make sense? Marketing is our best salesperson. That's what I'm saying. If we can create great marketing, we can actually get people to raise their hands saying, I'm interested. How many of you had a, has someone come to your website or come to your, uh, you know, call you up, said, hey, I read your reviews on Zillow, or I read your reviews online, and I'm pre-sold on you. Let's schedule a call. What do they call those? Come list me calls? Why, why is it more of our marketing geared towards creating those moments versus us annoying people to try to do business with us? So if step one in digital marketing is focusing on your past clients, step two is putting more effort and energy and resources into calling the right people at the right time so you actually can convert at a logical rate that makes sense to invest in it. Now, I said the death of the ISA because this is what I meant about ISA, Brad. Um, we pay our ISA $50,000 a year plus bonuses. We treat that ISA like a sales rep. They're on every sales call. They're on every sales meeting. They're an active participant in the company. They define their day. They look for opportunities to create efficiencies in terms of who they call, when they call, how they do things. They use a combination of live chat and direct messaging and texting and emailing and the phone to achieve their quota for the month. When, when you work in real estate, this, this is something brokers that I work with come to me all the time and say, Jimmy, you know, I got two or three of my top agents left me to start their own competing firm. Maybe Compass bought them. Seems like Compass is buying everyone these days, right? Um, right? It's true. I, 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 that's, like a, that's like a nervous laughter right there. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, they, they, they leave. And you're like, shit, I put three years training this person who didn't know anything. They worked at Applebee's, and now they're a top producing agent, and now they leave my company. And, and what happens is we become closed off. And what I tell my brokers that I work with, I say, listen, the only way to prevent someone from leaving you isn't the same way you prevent a consumer from leaving you, isn't loyalty. People are not loyal. It's important we understand that in the, in the business sense. They're going to look for other opportunities. It's you make yourself irreplaceable. And the way you do that is if you can control most of the consumer journey by hiring, an, let's say, an ISA or a frontline salesperson that's under the umbrella of the company who you pay a salary to, who actually qualifies and nurtures and actually sets up the appointments for your sales reps, then the sales reps are less important and they're less replaceable. And they're never going to leave to another situation where they have to do all that work. Does that make sense? Like, this is something I don't really understand. Now, obviously, the timing has to be right. You have to have the revenue. You have to have the, 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 the resources in place to make this decision. But rather than outsource the ISA job to underpaid, unqualified people who are inexperienced to call cold leads, we should actually pay people and attract the right talent to actually call qualified leads to convert at a much higher rate. We have to change the entire environment, okay? It's just so important that we do this. These are three companies you guys are all familiar with, all have recently gone bankrupt, Toys R Us, Circuit City, Borders. Back in 2000 and 2001, they outsourced their entire online e-commerce business to Amazon. That's not, like, it's not like, really stupid. These are, these, by the way, these are smart people. Everyone makes fun of these like, people at Toys R Us. These are smart people. They're not idiots. They're not morons. They're smart people. You can't build a, a hundred million, billion dollar business and be an idiot. Maybe you can, but like, there are some smart people in this room, right? You know, for Toys R Us and Circus City and Borders. But the problem is they outsourced their core competency. They didn't see where the puck was going. So they outsourced their core competency thinking that people are always going to go and soar. They're always going to want to feel and touch 
the product and merchandise and buy it. By the time they figured it out, it was too late. They brought it in-house. They weren't equipped to do it. They didn't have the muscle memory. You know, they had no infrastructure in place. And obviously, the list kind of goes on in terms of them all going bankrupt. Sales is your e-commerce. It's really important that we understand that's in the room. Sales is your e-commerce. It is your core competency. I am not going to outsource the thing that is going to differentiate me. My ability to connect with consumers, build a relationship, connect them with a qualified sales rep to fulfill upon that, that larger vision is the thing that my business exists to do. And if you outsource it or you underpay someone or you don't invest the training, you are setting yourself up for failure. Here's one last question for you. You know, I think everyone in this room can admit to the fact that if we talk to our clients more, and this, I'm, this is, I'm speaking to myself as well, if you talk to your clients more, you, you almost always will benefit from it. They'll remember you, they'll feel like there's, there's a relationship is still there, you're adding value, right? Everybody says, I want to call my past clients, and we do so on like the schedule. Like every 90 days, or we have some like drip campaign, a task that reminds us to call our past clients. And, and that, there's a bunch of reasons why that's stupid, right? But, but putting that aside for a second, the problem is, is that when you run a business, you never have time to do activities like that. You only get busier. So why aren't we empowering our ISAs or our sales reps to actually call our past clients on our behalf? Right? Hey, Brad, this is Jimmy calling with the Eric Rolo team. Eric just published an article recently about market trends in Boston. He wanted me to reach out to you to connect with you, make sure you saw it, because I think some of, these, you know, some of these updates are gonna affect you and your home, you and your condo. Is now a good time to talk, right? Like, that's not a difficult script. I just made that up in two seconds, and it sounds relatively normal, right? Like, why aren't our ISAs calling our past clients? If we know our past clients and our sphere of influence are 60 to 70% more likely to actually convert into business, why are we having unqualified, inexperienced people? Oh, wait, that's the reason, right? They're unqualified and they're inexperienced. If we treat them like professional salespeople and we put them on the umbrella of the company and we control the experience, we can leverage them to retain more customers. So one of the things I want to leave you with you guys today, and we got three more things to cover real quickly, is this idea that I want you to invest in digital marketing for retention. I want you to invest in making sales part of your core competency as an organization, okay? Just some other quick data for you guys. Everyone calls leads at the top of the funnel. You really want to call them at the bottom of the funnel. People who open up leads, or open up emails, visit specific pages. You want to call them at the bottom of the funnel. That's where the conversion happens. You know, the bottom line is this, is that if you can establish intent, you should pick up the phone and call the person. If they're just simply like going to your website and learning about what it is you do, you might not necessarily want to call them. You want to use marketing to nurture them, marketing to drive them down the funnel. Okay. This is an example of an ISA ad you guys can run, or a sales ad you could run. This is something that's worked really well for us at Curator, love your job. Every single, I've interviewed 15 people in the last two weeks, right? I hate doing it, it's terrible, I'm a really bad interviewer. I, like, I go into it, never read the resume, and then, you know, it, it's, I wish, I'm sure there was a class on like interviewing that I missed earlier, I really wish I was a part of, because I could have benefited from it. Um, it's not, I'm gonna stick around, all right, take some notes. Um, but what happens is every single person I talk to, they say, I go, I go, how'd you hear about us, right? It's like my first question, because like the only question I got. How'd you hear about us? And they go, I saw your ad on Facebook. You know, love your job. I have a job I hate, and I want to love my job. And we have, an, we have a page on our website, love your job. It's actual testimonials from existing employees, okay, saying what they like about or what they love about working at Curator. We advertise that on Facebook. As you guys can see, this is an example of our exact ad. You can take a picture of it if you want. This is exactly what we advertise, and we, every, we, have, we turn it off because we get too many applicants to come in off of one spell here, but every time we run this ad, it works. And here's what happens, and you guys heard a few other people talk about this, the importance of like hiring quality people. How do you find qualified people? You have a clear message, what's your value add? You want people who want to love their job, and when they click through to learn more, it talks about the culture, it talks about the what they actually do, it's actually real testimonials from your team, and that draws in the right talent. You know, so when I'm on a call with someone, I can immediately tell they're drawn to the, the why of Curator, why we do what we do, more so than just simply a salary, salary job as an example. So one of the things I want you thinking about here is, 
You know, rather than use job boards, you can use Facebook to advertise, to attract people, but you should have a page on your website, if you don't have, so already, don't have this already, have a page on your website that basically says, you know, love your job and explain what careers actually look like at your, and one thing I would do, a quick pro tip here, is I would give my team the ability to write reviews or testimonials about working with my team. A lot of people don't do that, it's really smart. It wasn't my idea, someone else came up with it. Like, write test have your team speak about what their job is. It's a lot more authentic and real. All right, trend number three, the end of an era. What, what happens in advertising, this is, the, this is why I said the end of an era. The end of an era in advertising. You guys are familiar with banner blindness. In the 90s, they discovered the fact that human beings would actually ignore ads online. They would actually not even see them at the top of the page because that's the place where ads were. So they just actually would ignore it. So people had the inability to recall what it was they saw, even if it took up 90% of the page, because they conditioned themselves to ignore it. What's happening in advertising right now is we're treating consumers like they're morons. And this is a, a, a very nasty trend in real estate. If someone doesn't want to buy or sell right now, our industry as a whole, exactly, they dismiss them. They get rid of them. Or we're saying, you know, if you don't buy now, you're basically, you know, an idiot, a moron. And we're seeing this in advertising a lot too, which is, no, thanks, I already have a bikini body. Okay? This is another example. No, thanks, I'm not interested in protecting my skin. <laughs> like, fuck you, L. <laughs> like, I, I, like, I don't understand, like, why, why, like, someone's, someone's writing these ads thinking it's super clever, and it's, it's not. It's offensive. And I think one of the things I want you guys to be aware of in advertising is, I, I got, like, so many more examples of this. I'm going to skim through them. Um, but the thing about advertising for me is that this is your, your advertising is something that represents your brand. So how you advertise to people is how they perceive you. It's sort of the fabric of your brand, right? The message you're trying to convey is going to basically convey an emotion. What do you want people to feel when they see a piece of content or a video you're producing and advertising? What's that emotion? Do you want them to feel guilt, shame, anger, right? Or do you want them to perceive you as an expert, as someone who's trustworthy? And in real estate, we make this mistake all the time. I see this a lot. This is an example of what they refer to as growth hacks and the SaaS space. Right, growth hacks. This is a good example. You might have someone come up here who's done marketing before, and they say, I got this great idea for you. If you want to increase your open rates by 10%, just add forward to the beginning of the subject line and send it to people. And then what happens? Anyone ever get this email? Someone forwards you an email, like a business? You think it's coming from someone you've already talked to, right? Or it's the RE, like replying, RE. And you feel like an idiot. You feel like you got tricked. So there's, there's this trend there right now happening in marketing and advertising where we think that tricking the consumer to artificially increase the performance of a campaign is a good idea. I'm here to tell you it is not a good idea. It's a very bad idea. And in real estate, I'm seeing this. Like anyone ever send an email without a subject line? Because like supposedly they get a higher open rate, and they actually do. But when you send an email without a subject line, like it just confuses the consumer. So they might open it like, what the hell is this? Oh, wait, it's just a marketer being really clever and cute, right? This is an example of an email. What's wrong with this email, guys? This is an email I got recently. It's back in January. Hi, Jimmy, just following up on my email. Cool, not important to me. I'd love to chat more about what kind of results you're looking for for Qualtrics trial account. Would you have time in the next day or two? Well, yeah, I think the issue here, look at the subject line. Who sends a second attempt? A fucking bill collector, right? <laughs> second, like, and I'm sure that has a really high open rate. It also has like, a, a really high like, piss you off rate. Like, they don't calculate that. So like second, so this guy sends me the email. I'm like, no, I don't want to schedule time. It's, there's so many things wrong with this email, right? And I, I don't want to go on a tangent, but like, this idea of I'm just following up on my last email. That is not important to me. There's no reason for you to say that, yet that's the first thing that you say when you send me an email. Your subject line is second attempt like you're a bill collector. Does that make any sense? So I think one of the things that we want to think about is uh, you guys are hearing a trend, hopefully, which is I'm, this, I'm very dogmatic about a consumer-focused approach to building a business because if you can align yourself with the customer and you can make that your mission, then marketing is relatively easy. It's when we start trying to do these hacks we run into issues. One of my favorite authors, Robert Cialdini, 
guy wrote a book called Persuasion. I want you guys to write this down. Persuasion, Robert Cialdini. It's C-I-A-L-D-I-N-I. C-I-A-L-D-I-N-I. Make sure I spelled that right. Dr. Robert Cialdini. Uh, wrote a book called Persuasion. Also wrote a book called Influence. Two of my favorite books on marketing, but one of the things about marketing that I've learned doing this for about 10 years now is that marketing is really all about human behavior, understanding what drives our decisions, understanding what drives our behavior. And these are six things that, uh, that Dr. Robert Cialdini uh, pointed to that actually have an impact on our behavior. Our willingness to comply, as they say in the psychology space, okay, which sounds really creepy, but that apparently means like to open up an email, to click on an ad, to read an article, to watch a video, okay? So there's a few factors that go into play here. Number one is liking, okay? Two are, I'm gonna go like around the six here. There's actually six, right? Authority, this is really brand. Scarcity, is there very few options or availability here? Reciprocity, it's actually a study done by this uh, religious organization back in the 70s where they would, uh, they were trying to raise money to build churches, right? I think some of you guys may have heard the story and they had a very difficult time building churches because they were some crazy religion. No one knew what they were. But what happened was they decided, said, well, we have to raise money, so we're going to start giving people flowers, okay? And when we give somebody a flower, even though they don't want it, the likelihood of them actually donating money goes up dramatically. They raised about $100 million over the course of a decade just doing this one tactic. What they would do is they would give out flowers at train stations and bus stations and at airports to this is before everyone kind of knew their game, and people get the flower, they didn't really want the flower, but now they have, they felt guilty, they felt like they had to reciprocate, and they had to give money, just, and they would throw the flower away, and then the person actually raising money would go in the trash and grab the flowers, and then come back and give them out to the next people, right? Reciprocity gives a sort of guilt feeling. We have to give something back, right? Commitment and consistency, we just like people who are, who are consistent, you know? One of my favorite quotes, I thought it was from Truman, but I think it's actually from the West Wing, which is our decisions are made by people who show up. I think it's Jeb Bartlett who said it. Um, social proof. Does everyone else like this? Does everyone else comment on this? Is this what's trending? So much of what we consume on a daily basis is put in front of us because of social proof. Okay? If you see an ad on Facebook, one ad has 100 likes, one has zero, which one do you think you are more likely to click on? All right? So, so when you start thinking about this, right, and I want you to get your head wrapped around this concept, authority, scarcity, reciprocity, consistency, social proof, you can start to apply these human behaviors that actually influence human behaviors to run better ads. Here's a couple of examples for you guys. These are three ads that we run right now. It's a great effect for us. The first one on the left-hand side for you is one about uh, our exclusivity at Curator, okay? Now, what we do is we're talking about, hey, we only work with a handful of agents and a handful of teams in a specific market, and when we sell out of a market, we don't really reopen up. So that is the scarcity play. Does that make sense? The one in the middle is us actually adding value. This is reciprocity. Hey, lots of things are changing that you need to be aware of. We have an article about this particular topic. Why don't you check this out? And the third one here is my buddy Amit who also recently, ironically, just got acquired by Compass. It's not important. Uh, this is a testimonial video. This is social proof, okay? Scarcity, reciprocity, social proof. So when we think about running great ads, it isn't about shame, it isn't about guilt, it isn't about making people feel stupid or making people feel like they're missing out on something that's never gonna come again. It's about leveraging some of these tactics, authority, scarcity, reciprocity, commitment, consistency, and social proof to actually drive human behavior. This doesn't just apply to ads, it applies to emails, it applies to content, it applies to videos, it applies to everything you guys do, okay? Let's talk about my fourth trend here before I wrap it up with my last one, which is video. Now, we got some people in this room who do video. I know Eric does video, Brad does video. We're at this point right now where what's so interesting about video is the impact video has on how people perceive us. Uh, you know, I did a show many years ago called The Water Cooler, 
and I did 115 episodes of The Water Cooler. It's a podcast we did at 9 o'clock at night. Me and my buddy, Chris, who's my co-founder, partner, um, we did a show, and we just basically gone on camera and talked about marketing trends. And we did it for three and a half years, 115 episodes. Uh, we generated maybe one-third of our entire revenue, annual recurring revenue, from that show. And it was just a video of us talking about important trends that were happening, drinking beers, you know, at 9 o'clock at night. And it's, it's a terrible, if you guys go back and look at our YouTube channel, it's like a really terrible quality, okay? Like, I mean, it's really bad quality. I mean, the, the content's good, but the quality's terrible, okay? Everyone's been talking about the importance of video for a long time. I, see, I think it's more than that. I think it's more than the fact that video is important. I feel like the businesses who actually adopt and embrace and start to develop a video strategy that actually can drive consumer behavior and actually attract business are going to have a monumental lead and build a huge moat around their business compared to the competition. What do consumers want to know? What do strangers want to know about us? They want to know, do we know what we're talking about? Are we an authority? Are we trustworthy? Do we know about the market? Are we an expert? You can't convey that, all that information in a blog post. You know, you can, but you're forcing the consumer to read. Video is really that medium, and, and you're seeing the investment with Facebook, even with YouTube. They're really doubling down and tripling down and promoting videos to the top of the feed to reach consumers. Just some stats for you. The sets that uh, the, uh, the article I mentioned or the blog I mentioned, Think with Google. So Think with Google, like, again, Google tracks all your stuff, right? All your browser history too, right? Everything. And what you'll notice is these are the moments that really matter to the consumer. They call them the I want to know moments, I want to go moments, I want to do moments, I want to buy moments, okay? And I'll, I'll come back to that slide so you guys can just see that, take a picture of it in a second. But just to define these things, so I want to know, this is when you're looking for useful information about a difficult decision. People look for you on YouTube, and they look on Google, and they look online to find answers to their questions. This shouldn't be a surprise to anyone in the room. We all do it, right? I want to go moments. I want to find something near me. I want to do moments, with this is like how to, which is a huge trend, right, the how to movement. And finally, I want to buy, right, what's the best option for me? These four options really should drive all of your video content, because this is what consumers are looking for. How do I buy a house? How do I not screw up buying a house? How do I avoid screwing up buying a house? How do I find a house near me? How do I know if the house is the right fit for me? How do I know if now is the right time to do X? Insert the, you know, the variable there. To give you some stats on this, this is crazy to me. 75% of how-to videos are watched longer than five minutes. The number one category on YouTube is how-to and the number one category within that category is for home improvement and repair. Go back to what we were saying earlier about the importance of past client retention. You know, retaining your past clients, retaining your existing business. If you're thinking about what do I create for them, all you gotta do is look at Think with Google. They explain it. This is what they're looking for. Ideas. People looking for ideas. Bathroom remodel ideas. Gender reveal. Ideas. I had to think about that one twice. Okay. <laughs> but you see that's, that's rising, right? People are looking for information that's relevant for them. I'm not going to go there. To avoid, the amount of searches have increased 150% to avoid. People want to avoid pain. They want to avoid conflict. They want to avoid making a huge mistake. People are Googling cooking oil brands to avoid. Like, that's crazy to me. Like think about just from the context for a second. People are searching for something as stupid as cooking oils. Do you think they're not looking for information about the single biggest decision they're going to make from a financial perspective in their life? Of course they are, okay? There's other examples of that as well, okay? So, you know, is it worth it? These are the major decisions that people make. Here's, here's what I'll say about video. And this is, this is the pro tip for you guys because I want to get tactical. A lot of people make this mistake. Even professional marketers make this mistake. You have this amazing how-to series. 
how to buy a home, how to sell your home, how to avoid making mistakes, okay? You produce a video, you're so excited, it's got an intro, it's got an outro, You've, you nailed it the 25th time, right? You're pumped about it, and then you upload to your YouTube channel and you don't do shit with it. And it sits there, it's got like five views, and typically it's you refreshing, okay? <laughs> I've been there, guys. When you create high quality content, okay? When you create high quality content, you wanna think about the distribution plan. And your content marketing strategy in 2018 is produce high quality content and use the other supporting channels to distribute it. So video remarketing, website, YouTube, email, Facebook, when you create something really great, you can distribute it across different platforms. Last tip for you, videos are important, the death of the ISA, investing obviously in client retention and creating great ads that are actually compelling. <coughs> Excuse me. Stories. Stories actually make a huge difference. And I'm gonna give you guys one example of this. When you promote a listing, when a listing is coming on the market, when you guys promote it for the first time, what do you typically do? Like what's the first thing you do when you have a new listing, you're excited about selling it, what do you do next? You do what? You already got the listing. You already got the listing. I hope you're not looking up online after you got it. Yeah, so, so yeah, after you, after you get it, right, what do you, what's your promotional strategy? You do a walk through the house, okay. But you've already got the listing, right? Yeah. Okay. Pictures coming soon at Facebook Live, which is actually really interesting. Um, I think the biggest opportunity actually happens before you even get the listing. Think about this for a second, okay? You're going on a listing appointment. You want to win that listing. You have a database full of a couple thousand buyer leads. What should you send to your buyer leads to get them excited about this listing appointment you're about to go on? If I'm going to go on a listing presentation, okay, the first email I'm going to send to somebody before I even go on listing presentation is the subject line is going to read, I'm about to meet a potential seller. So before I even go on the appointment, I'm going to send an email that says, I'm about to meet a potential seller. Okay, and in that email, I'm gonna to explain to the, my database, hey, I'm gonna meet the seller, they're listing their two bedroom condo in the north end of Boston, this property hasn't been listed before in the market, I'm not sure if they're gonna to decide to sell, it's really up to them, and you know, we'll see how the appointment goes, but would you like to get some information about the home before it hits the market if they decide to actually list the property? What am I using right there, guys? Scarcity. So before I even go on the listing appointment, I'm sending an email, I'm about to go meet with a potential seller. Now, two things happen. The first thing that happens is I get a bunch of really interested people who I didn't know existed in my database immediately replying to me saying, I'm really interested. So we just use this hook to qualify, that's marketing doing sales job, to qualify those leads, okay? The second thing is I roll up at that listing appointment like a boss. I have 50 replies from buyers in my inbox for people who actually are interested in their home, and I'm gonna go to the consumer and say, hey, I know most agents probably came in here and talked about how big their network was, or how successful their company was, but the number one thing that a, that a real estate agent should do to help you sell your home for the most amount of money is they should market it. And even if I don't get this listing, I already started that process. I already started marketing your home. Here's an example of 25 people who have actually are interested in your, pro are you guys gonna get that listing appointment 100% of the time, right? This is how we can use storytelling in the process of actually promoting listings. Guys, I know I'm out of time right now. Thank you so much for having me, I really appreciate it.